And so we continue in our journey through the book of Acts, where we're tracking communitas. And we come to Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas are in prison. Paul is on his missionary journey. At this point, Silas has joined him as his traveling companion. But here's the backstory to the story we'll look at. This story takes place in Philippi. Can we have the map, please? Philippi, you can't see it really well on the scrims, but there's Philippi to give some perspective. Down here is Jerusalem. So you can see the journey Paul's making. In Philippi, there was a slave woman. And this slave woman had the spirit of Python, and there's a huge history to the spirit of Python. Uh, it goes all the way back to the Greek god of Apollo and the Delphi oracle. But what you need to know about the spirit of Python and this slave woman is this gave her the power to predict the future. And so her slave owners made buku dollars off of her. Now the slave woman was following Paul and Silas throughout Philippi for quite some time. And as she was following her, them, she would shout out, these two men are servants of the Most High God. These two men are proclaiming a way of salvation for you. Somewhere along the way, Paul gets really frustrated. The text tells us he's annoyed, which is kind of interesting, right? Because it seems like some of the best marketing tactics you can have. If you get someone to follow you around and say, hey, don't look at my product because it's not really great, but check this product out. At any rate, Paul is annoyed. He turns around to this woman and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you spirit to leave. And at that moment, the spirit of Python leaves the slave woman. Now, if you're the slave owners, you are at this point furious because you have just lost your cash flow, your ability to make money. So these slave owners, they go to the higher-ups in Philippi, the legal authorities, the magistrate, and they just start making stuff up. These two men, these Jews, they're advocating unlawful customs for us Romans. These two men, these two Jews, they're causing an uproar in our city. And as they do this, crowds begin to join the attack. And the legal authorities buy into it. And so they send out an order for Paul and Silas to be stripped naked, beaten with rods, thrown into prison, into the innermost cell where they find their feet in chains to the floor. Now, if you are Paul and Silas, in this moment, everything is falling apart. I mean, think about it from Paul's perspective. Reverend Jana introduced Paul last week, Acts chapter 9, who used to be called Saul. God calls him into this new way of life. Really, God, this is what I get? I'm mean, just following you, and this is what I get. I don't know, maybe the old way was better. Here's one of the questions I want to engage this morning. And that is, is it possible that when it feels like things are falling apart, sometimes things might actually be falling together? When it feels like things are falling apart, sometimes things might actually be falling together. Think about it in your own life. Maybe you feel like you've been following God. You've been taking all the right steps. In fact, you're on the path that, that the universe has laid out for you. And things aren't working. They're not going as you planned. They're not going as you hoped. And somewhere along the way, you find yourself in all sorts of prisons and chains, chained to the things in life you never wanted to be chained to. Can I have the next image, please? How many of you can identify with this? <laughs> I mean, isn't this exactly the way life goes? You plan for this, and instead what you get is all kinds of swirls and circles and things you didn't ask for. We can refer to that as struggle or crisis. And in these moments, 
In these moments, we have to stop and, and look at our lives and look at our surroundings and ask, what are the things that are falling together? In other words, we could ask, what are the things that God is redeeming along the way? Because these are the things that will allow you to be in prison, but not imprisoned. These are the things that will allow you to be in chains and at the same time experience freedom. So let's take a look at the story, shall we? Acts chapter 16, verse 25. Along about midnight. By the way, let me say just a brief word about this phrase. I promise I won't do this throughout the story. But along about midnight can also be translated as in the middle of the night. When you see this phrase, and it is scattered throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament, in the middle of the night or along about midnight, when you come across it, it is the storyteller giving you a huge heads up that something big is about to happen. God is on the move. Pay attention here. Don't miss it. We'll see it next week at the end of Acts, a story that says, in the middle of the night. And you're probably more familiar with this phrase than you think. Remember, in the middle of the night, God passed over the Hebrew firstborn children. In the middle of the night, Jacob wrestled with God by the river, and God gave Jacob a new identity. In the middle of the night, the shepherds keep watch. In the middle of the night, Jesus... It's found in the garden called Gethsemane, praying, expressing his fear of death and suffering. In the middle of the night, Paul and Silas were at prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered. Every door flew open. All the prisoners' chains came loose. Startled from sleep, the jailer saw all the doors swinging loose on their hinges. Assuming that all the prisoners had escaped, he pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in, figuring he was as good as dead anyway, when Paul stopped him. Don't do that. We're all still here. Nobody's run away. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved, to really live? They said, put your entire trust in the master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live, and everyone in your house included. They went on to spell out in detail the story of the master. The entire family got in on this part. They never did get to bed that night. The jailer made them feel at home, washed their wounds, and then he couldn't wait till morning, was baptized. He and everyone in his family, there in his home, he had food set out for a festive meal. It was a night to remember. He and his entire family had put their trust in God. Everyone in the house was in on the celebration. At daybreak, the court judges sent officers with these instructions. Release these men. The jailer gave Paul the message. The judges sent word that you are free to go on your way. Congratulations. Go in peace. Now here's the thing. It's really easy to read the story this way. And if you go through commentaries, you'll see lots of commentaries that do it. You see the big thing that was happening here? God sent the earthquake. God sent the earthquake to free the prisoners, specifically Paul and Silas. Which, by the way, if you're Paul and Silas, this reading is just fine. But if you're the family down the street, and you have just woken up to find your home in shambles, and you've just woken up to find out your entire family has perished because of this huge earthquake that God sent, not such a compelling reading, is it? I mean, I don't know, I, I, I've just grown so weary of looking at disasters and tragedies and acts of violence and, and saying, yeah, God did this. Yeah, God did this. I've just grown so weary of it because when we just look for God in the violence and in the tragedy, then we forget to look for God in the healing. And God is always found in the healing. The big thing happening in this story, 
the big thing going on, the in the middle of the night, was God working through the Apostle Paul. Paul living out his new identity in Christ. The big thing happening was Paul didn't run. Paul stayed put. Paul stayed. And here's what's so interesting about the story. When we read it, it's like Paul was never really in prison, was he? I mean, yeah, I get it. Paul was in prison, but he was never really in prison, was he? Think about how the story starts. They're severely beaten, stripped naked, thrown into prison into the innermost cell with chains around their feet. And that night, they were praying and singing a robust hymn to God because that's exactly what you and I would do, right? And on that night, a huge earthquake comes. Their chains are loose. They're free. They're free to run. And Paul stays. Because in the distance, Paul sees the jailer. And a jailer with his own sword is about to do himself in. Because this jailer knows history. Acts chapter 12, when Peter escaped from prison, the jailer was executed. If your prisoners escape, you are executed. What does Paul say? No, don't do it. Don't do it. Nobody's run away. We're all still here. We've got your back. We're in this together. We're not going anywhere. Talk about communitas. This is communitas. Binding yourself to the other. Linking yourself to the other. And by the way, aren't we seeing something similar happen this weekend with Paris? We see crisis and tragedy and violence. And in the midst of that, we see voices raising up, saying, we're here. We're in this thing together. Don't run. Just stay put. We're in this together. We're not going anywhere. We've got your backs. Now imagine what Silas might be thinking. Paul, dude, let's go. Man, the earthquake has come. Our, our chains are loose. We're free. Let's go. God has put us on a mission. God gave us this mission. Let's carry it out. This is about freedom. And can't you imagine Paul saying, no, 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 Silas. You don't know the first thing about freedom. If we leave, this man dies. Paul would know something about new kinds of freedom. Remember in chapter 9, he's persecuting Jesus' followers. Now he is a Jesus follower, and he's creating other followers to live like Jesus. If we leave, this man dies. The gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ is about new life for all people, not just us. Therefore, we stay put, because if we leave, he dies. It's as if Paul was standing, saying to the world, because of the life I've experienced in Christ, there is a place within me that you cannot take, you cannot touch, you cannot move. These chains, they don't define me. He was free to go, but he binded himself to the jailer, to the other. And of course, you know how the story ends. The jailer is so impressed with this remarkable act of compassion that the jailer invites Paul and Silas into his home. They share a meal together. They share the story of Jesus together. He's baptized. His entire family is baptized. He's the one washing their wounds. And the great paradox and the great irony of the story, the one who played a role in Paul and Silas's oppression is now the one who is saying to them, Go in peace. You are free. Is it possible that when it feels like things are falling apart, sometimes things might actually be falling together? And I have to be honest with you at this point. I had my sermon notes for today. I had them two weeks ago on my phone. And I carved aside this 
Wednesday afternoon to finish my sermon prep for today. And I started at noon, and by 5 o'clock I was so frustrated. Oh, I was angry. Tammy walks in about 5, and she says, why are you so angry? I said, because I carved aside this afternoon to work on this sermon, and I wanted to have it done so I could move on to other things. And it is like I've got nothing done. In fact, I feel like I've gone backwards. And she says, well, why is this? <clears throat> I said, because I'm not sure I believe what I'm about to preach. I'm not sure I believe that when things start to fall apart, things are actually falling together. And maybe it's not that I don't believe it so much, but I don't know how to talk about it. And she says, well, it makes sense to me. Remember 18 months ago when the job I was in was sucking the life out of me? And it was just hour after hour after hour, and I had no energy to put into the family or to other things. And we made the decision that I would quit that job and take this other job, even though our salary was cut in half. And she says, yeah, now, like, look at it. I'm with the family more. I'm home on the evenings. I'm not bombarded with emails on my days off and time off. I have weekends free. Yeah, things kind of fell together, didn't they? And don't get me wrong. I hear stories like this all the time. I have stories like this. You probably have stories like this. But I also have other stories. Other stories where months went by, years went by, and things did not fall together. In fact, things just got worse. Like when after my brother died, years went by where things didn't fall together. Relationships weren't happening right. The depression wasn't going away. It was getting worse. Things weren't falling together. And when things don't fall together for me, my past was to run. And when I run, it's not really pretty because I tend to run to the things that don't bring out the best in me. They bring out the worst in me. Maybe you can identify. And see, the other thing is, is I've sat with too many people in the midst of significant loss, in the midst of grief. And the worst thing I could say to them as a pastor, the worst kind of pastoral care, was say, oh, brother, don't you worry. Don't you worry. It might feel like things are falling apart, but things might actually be falling together. Keep your head up. No. There are times when we let our heart break in a million different pieces so that healing can come. And in the same breath, I tell you, I believe it. I believe it. Because grace invites me, grace invites us to stay put. Grace invites us not to run away, but to stay in the struggle, to confront it and to face it. Together. So in light of that, let me ask one more question. In what ways in your life do you feel imprisoned? In what ways are the chains holding you down or holding you back? You feel like you've been stripped naked, beaten, thrown in a cell, chained to the ground. Maybe it's fear or it's your past or it's the deep pain or loss that you've experienced, or it's addiction, or pride, or ego, or a drive for more fame and more power. Are you bothered by what happened in Paris over the weekend? Like, does it put a little bit of fear in you? Does it put a little bit of fear in you about what we're handing down to our children? Me too. And do you hear Paul coming along in the struggle, giving us a word of encouragement? Don't go anywhere. Just stay put. Don't run from the struggle. Stay in the struggle because when you confront it, when you deal with it, that's where freedom is found. When you stay connected to one another, then you experience freedom. But bind yourselves to the others. You see, sometimes I think we become obsessed with escape during times of crisis. We become obsessed with escape during the time of struggle and we start praying, oh God, just take me out of this. Don't let me feel this. I don't want to feel pain. I don't want to deal with this. Just take me off somewhere else. But overcoming and freedom is found in staying put. And the truth is, in this life, you will have 
struggle. This community at some point will experience mighty struggle. Knock on wood. But the other truth is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news reminds us over and over again, you are free. You are free. So as the band plays this song, I invite you, if you would like, you are free to move. You are free to come to one of our stations that we have set up. We have two tables up front, as you can see, and there's also one table in the back. And there's chain links on these tables. I invite you to take a chain link. You can keep it. Take it with you. Let it serve as a reminder to you that in the midst of the chains, you can also experience freedom. There's also quotes on the table that remind us that we can go in peace, that we are free. I invite you to take one of those if you would like. There's also some kneelers, prayer kneelers. Maybe you just want to pray. Come up front and offer a prayer. God, I want that kind of freedom, that freedom that gives me the peace, the freedom that spreads peace in the world. As always, anytime we do stations like this, you are also free to stay put. You're free to sit and reflect. But if you would like to move and grab a chain link or a quote or move to a table or pray, now is your time. Amen.